Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining BrainMap today. Today we have a very special BrainMap seminar uh, with the P41 funded center for mesoscale mapping. So how is in Martino Center, the CMM is driving the convergence of microscopic and macroscopic imaging tools for human translational neuroscience by developing and applying the next gener generation of tools to study the special distribution and temporal orchestration of mesoscopic events in the human brain. So we will have four presentations on the different projects and then we'll have um, discussion. As a reminder, please address your questions through the Q&A. Um, before that, Bruce Rosen will give a general introduction. So Bruce, over to you. That was so good. I feel like you've almost uh, already done it, but uh, I'll drone on anyway. Um, in any case, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, very excited to have the opportunity to share with you um, what's going on with this uh, particular project. Um, small apologies to my colleagues who just heard me give a very similar presentation recently at our external scientific advisory board meeting, but uh, um, uh, I see there are others that haven't heard it before, so we're gonna go from there. So let me share my screen. And can you all see that? You're good? Okay, then uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead. So um, I thought the, um, uh, uh, I'd give a very brief introduction to our center and try to address some uh, key questions before I turn it over to our colleagues. So, you know, who are we, uh, the folks that are working on the CMM? Uh, what's the community that we serve? Um, you know, what's motivated us scientifically? Uh, and uh, what are the key program elements of our uh, uh, P41 grant? So maybe the first question that some of you have is, what is a P41? So P41 is a National Center for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. They used to be called Regional Resource Grants, but I've gotten scolded in the past that they're not regional anymore. They are national centers. So we are a national center for what we do. Uh, and this is just a cut from their website. Uh, these are supported by the uh, NIBIB, uh, the Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. It's a, a network of such national centers. They create uh, unique uh, technologies and methods, uh, and then very importantly, apply those technologies to a, a wide range of uh, questions, uh, basic uh, science questions, uh, uh, all the way up to clinical research. Uh, and the kind of the fundamental DNA of a P41 is interactions between the technical projects uh, and uh, intense collaborations and uh, uh, the development of a user community of people that will use the tools that we develop. So kind of a technology uh, a push and uh, um, a, a user a pull uh, for uh, these new technologies. Well, so here's our uh, CMM, you know, this is our community. Uh, it's uh, the folks here within the uh, Navy Yard, of course, and that uh, includes all the uh, uh, neuroscience community within uh, uh, MGH. But in addition, of course, we serve the MGH main campus. Uh, we serve our colleagues at MIT, uh, uh, colleagues at Harvard, colleagues at Boston University, uh, Northeastern University has to be added to this map uh, down to Brown. That's our uh, kind of our, our regional model. And then uh, a little further out, uh, and uh, you'll hear about this uh, at the end from Susie Huang, who leads our collaborative and service user group. We have uh, uh, established a collaborative projects and so-called service projects, uh, projects that basically uh, uh, investigators that adopt our technology scattered around the country. But one of the key reasons for presenting this to you, uh, our Martino's audience, is that uh, these are, we're not fixed in numbers in terms of the collaborators and service users. Uh, and so we very much hope that this introduction to our work will uh, inspire people to come to us and uh, bring us ideas for things that uh, uh, you'd like us to develop or uh, ways that you might want to adopt the tools that you'll hear about uh, to your own research. Okay, so what's, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, scientific vision around uh, this uh, Center for Mesoscale Mapping? So I like to think of the problem of neuroscience as uh, kind of the challenge of uh, doing things from the bottom up uh, as well as from the top down. So uh, at the kind of you know, very bottom, uh, there's the molecular and synaptic side as we think about the brain, moving up to neurons and then how those uh, neurons connect in uh, local circuits. And of course, uh, you know, our basic neuroscience colleagues do a lot of this bottom up uh, neuroscience 
uh, typically done in rodent models, but of course uh, done in everything from uh, C. elegans and aplesia, you know, uh, uh, all the way to, uh, um, you know, some work at this scale in, in humans, albeit not very much. Um, but in addition, uh, you know, uh, the kind of work that we tend to mostly focus on at the Martino Center, though we certainly do some of that bottom-up work, uh, is kind of from the top down, starting with the whole brain, maybe even uh, collections of brains through things like hyperscanning, um, uh, down to distributed networks. And of course, uh, a lot of what we do focuses on the network dynamics of the brain at, at uh, a kind of at scale. Uh, and then to detailed uh, uh, system level maps, visual system, motor system, uh, memory systems, uh, et cetera. Um, I would say uh, this particular perspective is one that uh, we often hear about uh, here at the Martino Center. But the question is, you know, where do these two scales meet? And, you know, for those of you that go to meetings like the Society for Neuroscience, where you'll see all of that work, you probably have noticed that the communities that tend to do this bottom up work and those that do uh, the top down work tend to be quite distinct communities. And there's really perhaps not as much communication as you might imagine uh, at that interface between them. And I think there's a, some really interesting kind of neuroscience questions that come uh, at that uh, meeting point, if you will. Uh, in particular, uh, people talk about so-called emergent properties of local and distributed groups of neurons. Something you know, somewhat magical that happens when neurons are acting uh, in groups of hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands, how they work together locally, how they, those local groups then connect. Um, what are the processes that uh, uh, occur at, at those spatial scales? Um, and of course, uh, from our perspective, from the Martino Center perspective, we have a keen interest in trying to measure what these uh, emergent properties are, especially in humans, where the uh, wonderful tools of optical imaging uh, uh, and optogenetics and uh, uh, other tools that we use uh, at the uh, microscopic scale really are just not feasible for routine studies of humans. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, these communities meet, uh, there are a lot of rewards to uh, covering that territory. And of course, I would like to see uh, that, uh, at least in humans, uh, that groups like ours that have perhaps started at the whole brain scale can work ourselves down to the meso scale. I think if we can do that, there's uh, uh, many rewards, uh, uh, mostly scientifically, but uh, along uh, with the uh, grants that will come from uh, those studies, if we can extend ourselves and press ourselves down into this MISO scale. So, um, you know, what do we even mean by micro, macro, and MISO scale? So this uh, comes uh, from the definitive source of all knowledge at uh, Wikipedia. Say, if you were a connectional anatomist, what would you think about? Well, micro scale really uh, is, for example, building maps of neural systems, neuron by neuron, and even synapse by synapse. And our colleague, uh, Jeff Lickman, uh, who many of you know at Harvard University, is doing these amazing uh, you know, synapse by synapse maps, uh, you know, from EM uh, sections. Um, uh, he's actually one of our collaborators on this project, uh, our collaborative project uh, through the Connectome 2.0, which is led by uh, Susie Huang, as many of you know. So this is this kind of micro scale. Uh, well, what about, uh, you know, the macro scale? So that's most of what we do, kind of millimeter scale to centimeter scale, um, you know, from a connectional anatomy standpoint, uh, for example, it's the kind of work that you're used to seeing here uh, on the left, uh, our beautiful uh, uh, connectome uh, uh, data. Uh, on the right, some data that I grabbed from the uh, WashU uh, uh, Minnesota group on the functional uh, uh, connectomes. Uh, these are maps that I would consider uh, kind of macro scale maps, and they're certainly ones that this uh, community is familiar with. Uh, but what about in between? Where, where would this MISA scale correspond? So, Rather than doing things at an individual neuron scale, others will work at that. Um, uh, you know, can we study, say, functional uh, and structural connectivity uh, at the scale of, uh, say, uh, local circuits, uh, column level structures, or what's happening uh, at, uh, at a laminar uh, level uh, within the cortex? Things that link hundreds to thousands of individual neurons uh, and the kind of properties that begin to emerge from those neurons when they're working uh, in concert at those scales. Um, now, uh, just the whole notion of mesoscale neuroscience uh, is one that's 
uh, you know, emerging. I just grabbed this, uh, actually Gary Bellis grabbed this uh, for me from PubMed uh, and I thank him for that. Um, you know, it, it's kind of been out there for a while, but uh, you know, only uh, slowly growing. Uh, notice that uh, the vertical scale here, there's still only kind of a hundred or so articles published uh, every year, but the trend is clearly upwards. And I think we really have the opportunity to kind of um, drive this growth. And I think it's quite likely that say over the next uh, 10 years, um, you know, this will really uh, begin to uh, hit its uh, exponential stride. Um, and at the, um, uh, at the level of uh, our preclinical models, I think a lot of people are beginning to think about these mesoscale. This is just a, a, a beautiful slide that comes from the Dunelia group showing the coordination of neural function in this uh, uh, zebrafish, uh, you know, embryo. Um, here, uh, you know, with calcium sensors, we're seeing individual neurons, but noting that they don't work individually, they're working uh, as coordinated clusters. So, you know, uh, those are the kind of clusters we'd like to see. Here's another recent paper just a few years ago by uh, Murphy et al, looking at mesoscale mapping uh, in the mouse cortex uh, and uh, looking at the uh, frequency dependence of cycling between these uh, across uh, macro scale functional modalities. So uh, just uh, one example of this kind of merging of meso and uh, macro scale. Um, I had some very uh, interesting findings uh, with uh, these uh, unique uh, uh, spatial uh, signatures of uh, macro parcellation based on the cytoarchitectural boundaries. Um, and uh, even more recent work has uh, now extended this right from the micro scale up to the meso scale by doing um, uh, two photon imaging of uh, calcium activity in individual neurons across large scales of uh, the mouse cortex, and then relating this to these uh, kind of mesoscale of uh, uh, functional uh, uh, parcellation units that we can now see in uh, animal models. So on the animals, they're working their way uh, up from the uh, micro to the uh, mesoscale and uh, with uh, some interesting uh, development tools even going to uh, the macro scale. But what about in uh, humans? In humans, it's gonna be very challenging. In fact, even from this Wikipedia site, they talked about uh, mesoscale mapping as very technically ambitious, saying it could only be probed at very small scale with invasive techniques or very high field MR on a local scale, really referring to animal work. But of course, the CMM's job is to change this and to make mesoscale mapping something that we can routinely do in our human uh, subjects and in our patients uh, to study phenomena that occur at these uh, scales. That's what the center is all about. Um, of course, the uh, Martino Center have been amongst the uh, leaders in developing this capability. This is uh, work uh, from uh, uh, Roger, Tutel, uh, Roger Tutel, um and uh, Shaheen Nazar, who've been uh, looking at, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, ocular dominance columns, uh, showing a beautiful test, retest, reproducibility of these, and even more important, showing the individual variance at visa scale of these phenomena, suggesting that you know, this is not something that you could do by simply averaging over uh, kind of the system level the way we typically do. This is something that's really going to require us to, to uh, be uh, doing this mapping uh, in individual subjects if we're going to want to understand the properties. Um, here's just more of the beautiful work showing that, in fact, these ocular dominance columns actually seem to show laminar coherence. So again, um, uh, the ability to be able to see what's happening at a laminar level as well as at a column level seems uh, uh, within our grasp, at least within uh, uh, model uh, uh, settings like uh, studying uh, uh, the visual cortex. Now, moving out from V1, it's interesting, the same group has shown that, for example, even within a single visual area, like area V2 or V3 or V4, that um, while uh, those areas will activate for example, to color versus grayscale or 3D versus 2D objects, what's interesting is that at this MISO scale, there's really not so much overlap between those. In other words, there are distinct parcellation units at this scale um, that have these distinct functions, even within system level areas like V2 and V3 that we think of as a, a single visual area, um, uh, giving us, uh, again, uh, really strong motivation to be able to study the brain at these spatial scales. And I think even more exciting uh, um, is the fact that now we're beginning to move from, say, uh, you know, simple visual system where there was a fair amount already known about these uh, column level structures, 
uh, off to parts of the brain um, where we know much left, much less about it. So here's some work showing mesoscale patches in the parietal lobe. You know, there's huge parts of the brain, including uh, pretty much all of our frontal cortices, so much of, uh, you know, governing, uh, you know, our human behaviors, where we really don't understand what the mesoscale structures are and what they can mean, in part because we don't have the tools to study them. The CMM's job is to develop those tools. So, you know, uh, with these tools, we hope we can begin to look at the spatial scale of these emergent properties, try to understand their, uh, uh, how they work and in what settings. Um, what are the structural motifs we might see, especially in parts of the brain that really are not been explored by any other methods uh, uh, at this spatial scale. Interesting to think about the temporal dynamics uh, of these uh, networks uh, and how they relate to things like uh, arousal, awareness, uh, even consciousness. Um, and then of course, uh, at the same spatial scale, there's of course, uh, literally hundreds of submillimeter deep brain structures uh, that we'd like to see how they modulate uh, cortical function. Uh, again, um, something that we can begin to study. Uh, so what are the components of our uh, regional resource and how do they link together? Well, there are basically four uh, principal projects. Uh, the first is, uh, um, uh, you'll hear about, uh, uh, is uh, our uh, technology research development project one, cross-scale integration and modeling. Here we're looking to try to uh, extend our uh, anatomical imaging capabilities uh, from uh, the uh, single neuron level down to the micron level with techniques like OCT and try to uh, build ways to actually directly connect that all the way up to ultimately in vivo imaging. Uh, the second TRD is focused on acquisition technologies for MR to try to push the uh, boundaries of in vivo imaging down to the mesoscopic scale. So this is really related to uh, uh, MR acquisition methods that allow us to uh, push that spatial resolution and functional uh, resolution. The third element, the third TRT, uh, addresses another set of questions that come up when you really begin to press these boundaries. And that's beyond what the machine is capable of doing. Uh, we begin to run up against the biological limits like peripheral nerve stimulation and the like. So TRD is focused on addressing these biological barriers to in vivo human brain acquisition uh, at the meso scale. Uh, and the fourth is to begin to now think about the temporal dynamics of this, to use this meso scale anatomical information to do a better job of magnetic uh, uh, source uh, imaging and also magnetic stimulation. So we're bringing TMS into this. Uh, so we're uh, integrating these uh, uh, anatomical and functional elements to begin to uh, press the boundaries of brain stimulation and recording technologies. Of course, um, you know, one of the things that I think maybe is, isn't unique to our um, concept uh, for uh, one, uh, at the um, our P41, but I think is a very important part of it, and frankly, which I think not all P41s do as good a job as we do, which is the connection between these projects. Really, these are closely interdigitated projects where results from one are uh, uh, directly used by others, for example, uh, cortically anchored um, um, computational neural nets for fMRI deblurring comes from having the detailed uh, anatomical uh, information as well as the techniques for CNN production from TR and D1. On the other hand, we need the detailed vascular anatomy that we're learning in TR and D3 to better understand the registration capabilities between the MR and OCD, uh, OCT data when we uh, begin to do whole human brain scale uh, uh, cross-modal uh, 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 integration. Um, motion correction techniques, which are a key part of TR and D2 from an acquisition technique are obviously key if we're gonna do functional uh, imaging uh, in TR and D3 uh, or apply those high resolution anatomical techniques for brain stimulation uh, uh, paradigms uh, in TR and D4. Um, we're gonna use the high resolution segmentation, registration and deep blurring from project one and move that uh, into project two. Um, uh, whereas in project four, we've developed these uh, boundary element uh, uh, models uh, for fast solvers uh, for TMS stimulation. And we can use that to understand the peripheral nerve stimulation challenges that TRD3 is addressing. So lots of interactions and of course, many, many others across the projects. Oh, there's one more I didn't even know it was coming. 
uh, where we'll be using fiber orientations uh, from project two and using that to uh, uh, better make predictions about brain stimulation in TRNG4. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we'll probably hold our questions to the end. That's uh, enough for me to talk and I wanna leave it over uh, to the projects. And I guess, Bruce, are you gonna start us off? Yeah, I think Yell is gonna show his screen. And while he's oh. getting set up, I'll just do a brief, a brief intro to our project, which is about establishing algorithms to um, build pipelines to allow us to transfer information from micro scale images to macro scale images. And that, you know, we've broken that down into four aims. The first, I'm going to go to the next slide, Yell. Uh, the first is really to increase the CNR and the resolution of the imaging, both the OCT and the MR. Uh, this involves distortion correction, um, uh, building a new rig for OCT. Um, and noise modeling. Um, so we're good. Yale's going to show a little bit of that. That's mostly Hui Wang, um, Chao Lu, and, and uh, Divya Maradarajan's work. Uh, AIM 2, we're not going to talk about today, but it's amazing work that Ayo Hedinian and Glacius is doing, essentially taking uh, photos of coronal slabs from, from uh, um, ex vivo and turning them into MRs so that we can do things like segmentation and surface modeling and morphometry. Uh, AIM-3 is going to be the focus of the talk today, and it's really kind of the workhorse of what we're doing, which is developing algorithms to register microscopic images to macroscopic images to allow us to transfer information. And then AIM-4 is kind of future work where we're going to put this all together. So next one, Yale. Right, so as I said, today, Yale is going to show all of the stuff. Uh, he's going to show a bit from AIM-1 that comes from Divya and Chow, uh, and then focus on AIM-3. Okay, over to you, Yale. Um, can you hear me? We can. We can, okay. That's fine to me. I was using my uh, admin button. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to focus on basically mapping microstructure across scales. Um, and so when you look at like the different scales of human neuroimaging, you can have on one hand uh, MR, where you have access to the whole brain, you have large coverage, uh, large number of subjects. Yeah. Intersubject variability. And on the other hand, you have, I think it's ex vivo including microscopy, where you will have very specific contrasts, um, but a lot less coverage and many, many less cases. Um, and we're trying to bridge the gaps between all these uh, different scales. Um, so, why do we care about microstructure? Uh, the main thing that there's actually a strong relationship between the microstructure and the microanatomy. And Bruce showed that. You can actually uh, predict uh, quite accurately um, cytoarchitectural regions from the cortical folding patterns. And the follow up question is what else can we predict from the MR? Uh, so, lots of stuff there's uh, the myelination, the link between structure and function, and things like cell densities that we all know have an impact on the MR signal. And um, so, the aim of the project to, to summarize is to build scalable tools to provide information across these scales. Um, so we investigate two paths really, to build to to bridge the gap in the space. Uh, one involves optical coherence tomography, which is a microscopic modality that preserves the three D structure uh, that can link with three D microscopy using clarification techniques. And the other one uses two uh, D histology. Uh, and in that case, to reconstruct three D volumes, we would use block phase photographs that are routinely acquired during dissections. Um, so the first aim, um, which is led by Divya, is to improve the quality of the ex vivo MR. Um, and when we reach those types of resolutions, so this, this is 120, 150 or 120 microns, um, they were more sensitive to B0 feed homogeneity. And so Divya developed um, a method to correct for those distortions using uh, field maps. And you can see uh, the difference when uh, you take the average of equals with and without the distortion correction. And this correction really helps reach an effective resolution of about 100 microns. Um, the other aim in, in this pipeline is to improve and accelerate the OCT acquisition. And so Chao developed a uh, improved and automatic OCT system that allows to first give 12-fold improvement in speed uh, but also 
it gives way nicer images to so higher resolution, high, larger field of view, and that's what you can see on the right. You can see the old images and the new ones. And I also investigate the use of uh, in index matching techniques that I also use in microscopy to improve the SMR of a CT. Um, and when we put everything together, so this is a project that involves several um, teams and collaborators. Um, so we extracted a block about the Boca, Boca's area in uh, full hemi that had been scanned, and then we acquired OCT and light sheet fusion microscopy with uh, several stains, so markers. And our collaborators also performed stereological countings of different types of currents on these uh, microscopy images. And we used vasculature to, re to cover this, uh, all these modalities back together and try for nonlinear distortions that happened during the processing. Um, and we went, when we put everything back together, uh, so this is the whole in the MRI, and we're going to zoom in uh, the broadcast area, uh, which is the bug that we extracted, and register that nonlinearly with the OCT that is, that is used as a bridge. And we can warp all the um, microscopy back to, to the MR space. And since we have lots of information in drawn on the microscopy, we can also propagate the cortical layers, uh, for example. And I show only like a single slice for visualization. But this is, this is actually a 3D block, so we have 3D information. And on each of these uh, microscopy slices, we have um, surgical counts. So each green dot or red dot corresponds to one cell that, had, that has been counted during surgery. And we can also use our warps to send back these uh, coordinates back to the mass space. Uh, and that's what this uh, animation is showing on the right. Uh, so you can see in green, these are uh, neurons. Uh, stained by, by the noise marker, and in red, these are internals that are stained by calvetting. And um, so, there's still a lot of work to do to scale up. Uh, we're working on automating uh, the feature extraction because currently we're using manually labeled ones. Uh, we're using CNNs or we use CNNs for almost every step, including registration and surface matching. Uh, we're currently processing more cases uh, of the same region to give us access to inter subject variability. And eventually, uh, the aim is to scale to, to add more regions on, on, on the whole point of, of, of these microscopic features. There are many people involved in this project, so thanks to everyone, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Jean. Um, who's next? What is next? I think, yeah. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Great. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, so TRD2, as Bruce had mentioned, is focused on acquisition technology for in vivo functional and structural MR uh, at the mesoscopic scale. Um, so the goal of this TRD is to overcome the current um, encoding limits in MRI to achieve in vivo imaging at the mesoscopic scale. And so I'd like to think um, the overall theme of this work is to combine different novel uh, encoding and reconstruction strategies with newly available instrumentation to achieve high imaging accuracy as well as sensitivity at this uh, meso scale. Okay, so Cowan sets up up is the overall lead of the project. He's recently relocated to Stanford. Uh, unfortunately, Cowan couldn't be here today, but he kindly provided me with these uh, slides to present. So Birkin and I are the co-leads uh, from the MGH side and the team consists of uh, Jason Stockman, Fuxia Wang, uh, Zijing Dong. Uh, Chong Yu Liao and Xiao Zi Kao. Okay, so uh, AM1 is focused on diffusion uh, using the G slider technique in the ACDC B0 Shim Coronary. So G slider is a, a simultaneous uh, multi slab acquisition that uses RF encoding to resolve, uh, in this case, uh, five sub slices per slab. So this provides increased SNR efficiency uh, and thin slices that enables this unprecedented imaging resolution, such as the 660 micron acquisition shown here. So we're combining this uh, G slider with the ACDC shim coil to provide dynamic uh, slice by slice shimming. Uh, here you can see an example of the B0 shimming in action applied to both slabs simultaneously, showing improved performance in the bottom of the brain. Um, so AIM2 uh, is applying the time resolved uh, distortion free fMRI technique, uh, EPTI, uh, to high resolution functional imaging. 
So Fushra Wang, the inventor of this technique and who recently presented her uh, PhD uh, defense on this topic is here and she'll describe this in more detail in just a minute. Uh, but I'm really excited about this method because um, not only uh, does it uh, provide distortion and blurring for free fMRI data, it also allows us to increase neuronal specificity uh, by enabling a pure T2 bold contrast, which is really challenging to achieve in practice. And finally, AIM-3 is focused on mesoscale structural imaging by combining uh, this relaxation resolved acquisition uh, and wave type encoding. So we've shown in the past how wave type e can provide high acceleration for efficient anatomical imaging. And here it's going to be combined with the shuffling approach uh, to time resolved imaging. So shuffling can be applied to resolve hundreds of contrasts in a single acquisition. And when combined with the wave encoding, it can provide even higher acceleration factors to enable to target high resolutions. We're also applying this uh, ACDC coil also to help with this anatomical imaging. So here the shimmer can be used with a kind of time varying field to help with spatial encoding. Uh, this uh, multi-frequency wave encoding, or uh, MF wave, adds a small additional encoding field to the wave type readout to improve acceleration performance, as you can see here on the right. So I wanted to show this as a nice example of how we can use this instrument in new waves, uh, both for the original intended purpose of you know, B0 and homogeneity correction, as well as for uh, spatial-temporal encoding. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here, um, give the floor to Fushua. Uh, while she's setting up, um, well, I guess we'll wait to the end for questions. So Fushua, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, Great. Just going to share my screen. Um, um, okay, cool. Um, so my name is Felicia, and uh, I'll give a brief introduction on TRD2 sub 82 on time resolved distortion free functional MRI based on EPPI. And thanks for the introduction, John, uh, for on the EPPI. Um, and uh, so the aim of this um, uh, work is to improve the functional resolution of both the fMRI, which depends on more on spatial resolution, but also on concordance of neural activity and vascular responses. Commonly used to start bold or assisted to large treating vessels that can be away from neural activity sites that lead to low specificity. So if we, if we want to look at the microvascular signal to potentially uh, get more accurate localization near activity, uh, we can use T2 bold fMRI that has been shown to have that um, higher microvascular specificity. However, the current acquisition for T2 fMRI, for example, Spinnaker EPI suffers from T2 prime contrast contamination with undesirable large training vessel bias and leading to compromised specificity as well. So the reason why um, Spinnacle EPI has T2 prime contamination is that you combine the signal with both T2 and T2 prime contrast across the readout to form an image. And the signal change across readout also lead to distortion blurring that will compromise the effective resolution. So we use our recently developed acquisition method EPTI to resolve distortion and blurring free pure contrast multi-echo images across the readout. And this is achieved by designing a spatial temporal encoding method that can efficiently sample the phase encoding and time space and accurately recover the fully sampled KT space. And from this KT space, we can extract data that are, that are sampled um, at exactly the same time point and to get a time series of distortion blurring um, images from this KT space. And from which we can extract pure T2 contrast spin echo image to address the T2 prime contamination and increase the specificity. We can also extract a series of asymmetric spinnacle images with varying T2 prime weightings to investigate the microvascular effect across the spinnacle radar. Um, finally, we can get the conventional EPI uh, acquisition data uh, with different uh, echo trim length uh, so we can compare the EPTI data with conventional EPI in a single scan. So here we show that while conventional EPI has severe distortion compared to the distortion-free reference, EPTI provide distortion-free images even at high field strength with more severe bezoic homogeneity. And the EPTI extracted conventional EPI data are also distortion-free by uh, removing the B0 in the KT space. And this feature really ensures that all images concurrently obtained in the EPTI acquisition are perfectly matched, enable fair comparison, between different uh, contrast images. 
Another advantage of VPTI for high-resolution fMRI is that uh, it's robust to dynamic distortion change due to B0 or susceptibility change. And here shown on the left is the conventional EPI after dis distortion correction across different dynamics. And we can see the dynamic distortion changes that are hard to correct for, uh, while EPTI provide images that are static across time and allowing higher reliability for a functional MRI analysis. Next, I want to show the ability of multi echo images provided by EPTI to resolve the variant to define contribution across spin echo laydown. So in the theoretical signal model, we expect to see large T to prime weightings at the beginning echoes, and then which will then decrease and achieve minimal at the spin echo point and then comes back as it moves away from the spin echo. We perform a visual tax experiment at 70 and look at the activation profiles across multi echo images. Before the spin echo, um, it start with activation uh, in the CSF. As they move closer to the spin echo with decreasing T2 prime contribution, less activation in the CSF was observed compared to the activation in the gray matter. We can see the peak of the activation gradually shifts from centering the CSF towards the gray matter area on the side. And after spin echo, with increasing uh, T2 prime contribution, the bias in the CSF gradually returns. And this can also be seen in the cortical depth profiles uh, with beginning echoes showing blue with large amount of T2' prime weightings has expected bias to large vessels show as a depth profile that peak at the pure uh, surface. And as it moves closer to the spin echo from blue to the green and lower and lower pure surface bias would, uh, would, were observed and show as a flat, flatter profile. And the pure spin echo in light green achieves the smallest slope and minimal bias when we move away from the spin echo from green to red, uh, the bias returns and the curves come uh, back up as expected. So this shows that the amount of large vessel bias across resolved multi-echo images um, across the spin echo radar uh, shows a good correspondence to the amount of T2 prime weightings in the theoretical signal model. Finally, we compare the EPTI pure spin echo with the conventional EPI um, data with four shot and six shot acquisition and show that in conventional EPI, a longer readout can lead to larger microvascular bias, while the pure spin echo provided by EPTI still shows minimal bias with improved specificity over conventional spin echo EPI. And that's all about uh, the sub aim two on a time resolved distortion free function MR based on EPTI. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, Larry is next, I think. Share screen. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> is that the right screen? Perfect. So yeah, I, I'm happy to describe the goals of uh, TRD3, which is to try to address what we call biological barriers uh, to in, in vivo human brain MRI acquisitions. And so the scientific premise of this project is that the barriers to achieving the mesoscale fMRI and MRI that we need are more and more becoming primarily biological. And we need mitigation strategies for this. And uh, the three most important ones that we identified were, Why it's not advancing. There we go. For uh, uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, which limits our ability to make stronger and stronger gradients. We saw this uh, in abundance with the development of the connectome gradient, that it's now uh, possible from an engineering stat uh, standpoint to solve the heat removal and power and electrical uh, challenges of strong gradients. Um, and build a gradient that was really bigger than we could use in all situations. Uh, happily, the connectome gradient, uh, its main use was diffusion, which has uh, only relatively mild PNS problems. But when you start applying those gradient strengths to things like DPI readouts, you get much, much uh, more uh, difficult peripheral nerve problems. And the second problem we want to address is the motion one. And this is as we go to higher resolution imaging, 
of course, uh, patients and subjects can't stay still, and we get these standard uh, motion artifacts in our image. So I'll present uh, first on the PNS work by Matthias Davis, pictured here, who's been developing a modeling framework to try to allow us to put PNS modeling into the gradient coil design and also to test other mitigation strategies. Then for the motion, I'll be showing work uh, by Steve Cowley and uh, Daniel Pollack, who've been working on uh, using uh, just the data present in K-space to fix the motion in the image. So basically, uh, there's no markers or there's no navigators. The underlying assumption is that the motion information is also encoded into the imaging data. And a smart enough recon can separate it out and solve for both the motion of the patient and uh, the image itself. And when you do this, you get uh, an uncorrupted image. And um, yeah, so basically trying to solve for those two types of variables encoded in our data. And uh, finally, uh, AIM-3 talks about the biological point spread function of fMRI. Uh, we've known for some time that uh, vascular artifacts creep into the fMRI maps as sort of large blobs. And we're uh, trying to develop a, a machine learning approach to basically learn exactly how that happens and then remove it from uh, say a retinotopic map in B1. This is work by John Paul Nini. It's leading that. So the three sub aims are uh, listed here, PNS uh, modeling. I'll, I'll just give you a taste of what we're doing. It's basically a complete modeling of the purple nerve uh, system and, and really trying to understand nerve dynamics and utilize it uh, through things like taking advantage of a pseudo refractory state and, and also things like using surface electrodes to mitigate the stimulation effects. The name two um, is to extend our work on motion correction and link up with uh, project two and apply it to EPI data, which is also multi-shot data. And then aim three uh, is to remove the vascular blurring effect uh, using a, a CNN, using both prior vascular knowledge and a unique sort of ground truth data from B1 retinotopic patterns, where we know what it should look like and then, of course, we can measure what we get and, and with the model, based on a model of the vasculature, try to figure out how to correct it. So let me get into AIM-1 a little bit. Matthias has made a, a lot of progress on this. It starts with a, a full body model for electromagnetic simulations. That's not uh, particularly uh, novel. There's a lot of body models available for that purpose. Uh, he does have a particularly good one that we've adapted. But what's absolutely unique about his model is that it also has a full, a relatively full peripheral nerve model built into it. So we can see exactly where the nerves run in relationship to the electric fields induced by the gradients within the anatomy. And that's very important because the anatomy shapes the electric fields a lot. He then basically solves for a representation on a Huygens surface just outside the body. This uses the so-called Huygens principle, that if you can define uh, what's going on on a basis set on a surface outside uh, the body like this, you know everything you need to know. And then that completely describes the information within, uh, certainly for the electromagnetic fields. And uh, then we have the electric field, say, in the body. And we know what each one of these little dots represents, a little basis loop or current source at that location, we know the electric fields it produces. He then uses a neurodynamic model to assess what this does to the nerves. And that's interesting because an E-field alone is not uh, sufficient to, to cause nerve stimulation. The E-field has to be along the nerve and it has to have a gradient along the nerve. So it creates a, a potential drop across the nodes of Rambier. So orientation is important as well as the hotspot and uh, the size of the nerve also matters. So a hotspot, of course, without a large nerve in it uh, doesn't uh, generate any stimulation. We're very fortunate that the lar ner large nerves create the stimulation that we're worried about. So uh, the, the framework looks like this. You pre-compute for this basis set on the sarcophagus, this giant set of information about how every little current element on this surface interacts with every nerve path in this body model. 
And this is represented as a large matrix of the contributions of each current element on each path. And then that large matrix can be consulted, for instance, very quickly during the design process. So this uh, little movie shows how the winding patterns uh, might be warped to try to get favorable PNS stimulation in a, a body gradient. And uh, we've, we've only done this theoretically so far for body gradients, but I'll show you a little work that we've done that has paid off in some real life gradients. Uh, the other thing you can do is once you have compiled all this information is very quickly check what every possible body can position uh, does. And this allows us to be much more smart about monitoring PNS, for instance, if we know, for instance, where the body is. And that's one of the other goals of the project is to get smarter about predicting PNS. Well, let me uh, just share with you one of our first uh, successes. And that was working with the Siemens gradient team uh, on the design of the impulse gradient. Uh, this is a large head gradient. It's sort of the, the current generation of an fMRI gradient. It has just amazing performance characteristics for EPI and functional imaging. Uh, a gradient max of 200 millitesla per meter. So compare that to the Prisma is you know, 80 and a slew rate of 900 compared to the Prisma's 200. So both fast and strong. And of course that's of absolutely no interest to us if, if it is limited by PNS and you can't use it. Head gradients are better than body gradients in that they're not as limited by PNS, but this generation of, of head gradients is firmly PNS limited. So what we did was we sort of uh, put ourselves in, in an optimization loop and checked the PNS of wind candidate winding patterns for Siemens for about a dozen or so winding patterns and helped try to balance things like PNS in the head versus PNS in the shoulders. And at the end of the day, we were able to kind of converge this process and generate a, uh, a, a coil design that Siemens actually built and tested in uh, something like 30 uh, volunteer subjects to get the experimental thresholds. This graph just shows how the blue experimental thresholds line up with both our male and our female models. So we're pretty able to characterize uh, this gradient. And we've also done this similar test for other gradients as well. And then it shows where the stimulation happens. And again, it's uh, fairly well balanced between the forehead and the shoulders. So uh, exactly what our design was trying to do. And perhaps most importantly, we were able to significantly increase the threshold This and do better compared to uh, competitor gradients. This is uh, the GE's version of sort of the same super large head gradient. It's not as big. It's not as linear. and uh, it uh, is considerably more PNS limited. And this was about where we started out when we, when we just took the Siemens uh, first draft of the design. So through the PNS uh, uh, modeling, we were able to come up with a design with a significantly better uh, threshold. So now this gray area is a sort of usable parameter space of the gradient, the, the, what the gradient can actually achieve in terms of G max on the y axis and rise time on the x axis. And you can see we now can utilize almost all of the um, physical operating space. So, on aim two uh, is trying to mitigate motion in MR imaging and mainly in uh, anatomical MR imaging, but actually any multi shot imaging. And this is based on the idea that the coil array itself encodes motion in the data. So if the head is moving in a 32 channel array, as it moves to the left, the left-hand side elements get brighter and the right-hand side gets darker. And that's just simple geometry of these uh, close fitting arrays of helmet type uh, coils. And so in some sense, the, the position of the head is encoded in the data, along with of course the case-based data of the image. So we use a generalized forward model to, uh, to explain the measured data vector S, that's all the case-based data of all the coils, the encoding matrix, and the voxels. And the difference is, is that we don't just say the head is in one position, we allow the head to be in a different position for every shot. And so there's, uh, that's described by six parameters of position, and there's a lot of shots, so that's a lot more parameters, but we uh, have a lot of data and we can try to solve for that. We have a lot of extra channels of the array. 
So it all comes down to solving this uh, inverse problem where we now, instead of just solving for the voxels in this X vector, we're solving for position uh, variables embedded in this encoding matrix. And this is a, a challenging joint optimization problem. And what Steve did initially was divide it up into a subset of voxels that was maximally sensitive to motion. Those are shown in blue here uh, in the X and a much larger set that we only have to update occasionally during the iteration. That allows us to do a lot more iterations in a reasonable amount of time. It was still taking hours to days to solve this inverse problem, but it was working very well. And then the next step was to use a CNN, a machine learning step, to sort of jumpstart the process and also to sort of refine uh, the direction of the search and the iterative processes. We called that method Namer, and uh, that also worked fairly well and it was a nice advance. And then the latest advance is actually to use a scout acquisition. So now for the first time, we're actually taking a little extra data. It's about three seconds of additional data that we use to jumpstart uh, the optimization and guide it. And this is work of being uh, checked by Daniel Pollock now, and he's making good progress in applying this to different um, sequences. And the really nice thing about this method, it, it converges very fast. And so Steve has implemented this in the Siemens ICE recon, so it can recon online in just a couple of minutes. And that's a, that's a big uh, step forward for us. Then the final aim I just wanted to introduce uh, is, is sort of John's aim, uh, working with Michael Bernier and uh, Olivia Weisman. And uh, it's about addressing biological barriers in uh, human brain uh, fMRI acquisitions. And uh, you know, this came out of the, the work some years ago on the so-called M where John flashed a, a kind of curvy M up on the projection screen that was warped by the logarithmic mapping so that on the flattened visual cortex, we would see uh, a more straight M. But of course we noticed that uh, both there were blobs and other corruptions of the process. It wasn't a perfect M. And that near the white matter surface, it was uh, considerably better than near the peel surface where it got more blobby. And we attributed that to corruption by uh, vascular artifacts with large vessels. And so this begs the question, you know, can we uh, get rid of this? Uh, Michael's been working very hard on making very high quality vascular maps of individuals. And so now we know a lot about the individual vessels that uh, are possibly corrupting this process. So we have that now as an input, to potentially use as prior knowledge. And uh, John and uh, Michael are putting this all together uh, to uh, make a, a full forward model, which will allow us to then uh, train a CNN and uh, be able to apply that to get an inverse of this modeling of how the vasculature corrupts it. It's, of course, more straightforward to figure out how the vascular corrupts it than to try to reverse it and get an uncorrupted uh, estimate of the map. And uh, the one thing that's unique about this um, is on the visual cortex, we do have ground truth because we know if we do everything right, what the M should look like in an uncorrupted sense. And here's, a, of course, a picture of John, a little bit blurry. And uh, the whole point is to make them look a little sharper. And uh, I would note that uh, even in this final version, John is not completely uh, sharp and not completely clear. He's still a little blurry. So we don't, we don't expect to be able to remove all of the corruptions, but hopefully make it a little bit better. So that concludes uh, my introduction to TRMD3 uh, and its three aims of the three types of biological corruptions, if you will, or limitations that we're trying to address, peripheral nerve stimulation and gradients, motion and the anatomical imaging, and the effect of vascular blobs and corruptions in the point spread function of fMRI. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, so we have now a presentation for the last project. So Mati is going to be talking. Uh, uh, Mati, do you want me to go or do you want to have an introduction? I will do just a, 
two slight introduction and then then you can sure. go after. Okay. So, so TRD4 aims to provide integrated methods for electromagnetic brain stimulation and recording, and it's led by Apo Rummema and myself. And this slide shows our scientific premise. We will namely extend the connectivity information provided by anatomical and functional MRI and MEG by doing multifocal stimulation, especially with multi-channel stimulation devices and recording the brain activity with EEG, MEG, or fMRI afterwards. And by doing this, we can selectively modulate and record network level activity in the brain, and in particular, infer causality and directionality of the connections between cortical regions. Mati, oh, we, we didn't see any of the slides. You don't see the slides? Sorry for interrupting you. About now. I do see your screen now. Yeah, I see a black slide. Yes, now. it should be black. Okay, perfect. That's good. good. So, and now you see A1. Yeah, we do. Okay, good. So, so in AIM-1, we will provide fast and accurate uh, forward solutions, that is calculations of the E-field, electric field for non-invasive brain, brain stimulation. And uh, thanks to their speed, they can be visualized in real time, as we will see later. And in fact, due to the reciprocity of the stimulation recording, we can benefit from these developments in forward solution also in MEG and EEG forward model. Now, especially in conjunction with multi-channel de uh, stimulation devices, we can also formulate an inverse problem, which means that we have defined targets in the brain here, the primary motor and som somatosensory cortices at the hand area, and we optimize the stimulation parameters to specifically target these regions. And the result of this optimization is shown in the last row of this, this column. Then in AIM-2, we will create integrated real-time software, software which will, first of all, be able to do this targeting for stimulation. And second, it will record MEG and EEG activity following the stimulation and estimate the sources in the brain. And on, of course, for this second AIM, we also use the results of the first day. Then finally, in the third AIM, we will employ mesoscale details of the cell organization and fiber orientations to more specifically determine the stimulation effects on a mesoscopic scale. And these methods will be also ultimately integrated with the real time software as well. And I will need now leave the floor to Mohammed, who will present his latest results from first TMS modeling and targeting, which relate directly to it. But thank you. Uh, can you guys see the slides? Yes. All right. So my name is Mohammed Danisan, and I'm working with Apon Memma. And today I will be discussing our recent dipole-based magnetic stimulation profile, or MSP, approach for real-time TMS electric field calculation. Uh, with recent updates of the BMFM library, we can accurately calculate the E-field of the TMS code within 10 seconds. However, we need to further speed up the computation to be able to keep up with the 5 to 15 hertz frame rates of coil movement that is captured with the neural navigation system. So the goal here is to gain significant speed up by using the BMFMM to pre-calculate the E-fields of the stationary basis set. Initially, we covered the subject as magnetic dipoles and compute the incident and total fields for all the dipoles using the BMFMM solver. And the idea here is that we can match the incident field of any TMS code with the weighted sum of the incident field from a stationary sources and get the matching coefficient. Now, since the total E field of the code only depends on the incident field and the tissue conductivity boundaries, we can apply the same coefficient to the dipole's total E field to get the total E field of the code. 
So we place three orthogonal dipoles at thousand locations around the surface. And on a simple spherical model here, you can see that uh, the dipoles amplitude adjust according to the pole movement to match the incident field. Uh, to speed up the incident field calculation of the pole, we utilize the spe special invariance characteristic of the incident field to obtain the, an interpolation function. Then this interpolation function can be used to basically find the incident field at any desired surface within few milliseconds. The full pipeline of the dipole-based MSB approach consists of the offline pre-calculation step and the near real-time step, uh, in which it consists on one step uh, of basically <coughs> interpolating the uh, grid incident field into the desired surface and two matrix multiplication. One to obtain the matching coefficients and the other one to apply this matching coefficient to the dipole's total field uh, to get the total E field of the toy. Uh, we call this dipole basis solution the magnetic stimulation profile approach, uh, which only needs to be calculated once per subject, and the stored solution are then used for the real time E field approximation. Another benefit of this method is its independence of the TMS quota. For instance, here we compare the MSP approach with the BM solver for two commercially available TMS quotas, which show comparable result both in the amplitude and the spatial distribution of the defects. Uh, we tested the benchmark compute, uh, computational benchmarks of the MSP approach and basically leveraging the offline pre-calculation uh, with the dipole sets allows for E-field approximation of less than 100 milliseconds. And this video shows our re uh, latest development of interactive E-field door navigation. The experiment setup consists of the localite navigator system, which can track and stream the coil position into the second PC in which the MSP-based calculation are performed. And here we were able to achieve the frame rate of six hertz for both calculating the equal as well as displaying it. Uh, the MSP approach can also be used in the multi-channel TMS area as Mati mentioned, and here we have a recently developed three-axis coil design which consists of three orthogonal elements and can be placed in, a, in an area setting as shown on the right. So for the initial test, we have a two by three coil array interface with the navigation system. And it's worth noting that uh, the real-time field calculation is an absolute must for the case of multi-channel uh, stimulation because basically the E-fields from all coils must be combined to synthesize the desired E-field pattern. And finally, I would like to show this is our first inhuman test with the two three-axis coils. We determined the uh, motor threshold by sending simultaneous pulses to the Z elements of each three-axis coil is shown in red. And uh, to, the idea was to basically mimic a figure of eight coil and recorded the super threshold EMG responses. Now the distribution of cortical E fields compared to the commercial CV60 coil shows that the three-axis coils in a multi-channel array, in this case a two by a three array, is working as intended. And so to summarize, uh, we have showed the capability of MSP approach to calculate the TMS in this E field within 100 milliseconds. We were able to reduce the computational co cost of accurate E field modeling by leveraging the offline MSP pre calculation. And also, it's important to know that E field visualization improves the accuracy of conventional TMS targeting and is a necessity for the case of multi-channel uh, TMS array. So thank you very much and I'll be open to any comments or questions. Thank you, um, Susie, over to you. All right, I'm gonna wrap up with just a very quick overview of our collaborative and service projects. So um, an integral aspect of the P41 um, center is uh, allowing us to basically refine our technologies through these push-pull relationships between various collaborative projects. So we've assembled um, an amazing set of collaborators across the country 
um, targeting various problems that really utilize our technology to look at the mesoscopic scale. Um, this is just a list of the um, topics and, and themes encompassed by our current collaborative projects. Um, and they include sort of integrating images across scales, looking at new contrast mechanisms for defining tissue properties, doing functional imaging at the mesoscopic scale, and also doing very high spatiotemporal measurements for modeling and brain stimulation. Um, our service users um, are basically those who are early adopters of this technology and want to apply it for various neuroscientific questions, um, questions relating to basic biology. And so this is just an example of the various service projects that we've assembled. Um, so um, one of the key points is that we'd like to really reach out to the local um, Martinos community in the greater Boston area and actively solicit collaborative and service projects. So if you're interested in learning more about um, our P41 Center and would like to partner with us, um, we've recently launched a website at cmm.martinos.org. Um, it's going to be populated with a lot more content in the coming few weeks, um, but you can get a basic summary of the projects that you've heard today. And I'd also encourage you to follow us on Twitter. We recently launched a Twitter account um, at MGH underscore Mesoscale and would love to have um, to interact with you in these various forums. Thanks very much. All right, thank you very much. I think that concluded our presentations. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for their presentations and I want to invite Bruce to start the discussion. And um, yeah, and if you have any questions, just please address your question using the Q&A. Please do. I, um... First, I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues for uh, giving a synopsis of uh, what they've been up to. But I think you've probably gotten a sense that uh, what they've been able to present is really just the tip of the iceberg of the work that's going on. Um, it's been a, a great fun. It's a very active group. Um, if there are uh, elements of uh, problems that uh, we didn't have a chance to touch on, please uh, directly reach out to the uh, project leads and they can put you in touch with folks that are working on it. I know there was a lot of content that we didn't have a chance to talk about. Uh, and as Susie said, uh, and as others have said all along, um, what makes a P41 successful uh, is not just the, uh, the clever people building the tools, but uh, um, a community of users willing to uh, you know, work at the uh, bleeding edge of those technologies. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's really, uh, though we're very happy with the group of people that uh, Susie and others have uh, uh, gathered from around the country, there's really no better uh, community of users than the ones I'm speaking to right now. So we very much encourage you to reach out to us if uh, anything you hear uh, appeals to you. If you feel like you have a contribution to make to our technologies, please share that. These collaborative projects are very much a kind of push and pull with a two-way street. Uh, or if you feel that there's just a tool that you would like to get your hands on to help your own work, that's what these service projects are all about. And uh, we are very much uh, open for business. So with that, um, <laughs> have, have we run out of time? Do we have, uh, we have time for some questions? I suspect that people are willing uh, to ask any, but at least I'm not sure I'm seeing any. We don't have any questions for now, but we do have time for questions if anyone or if any of the panelists wants. We must have been extremely clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anyone wants to start a discussion, that's um, great too. Any of the panelists want to. Thanks. Great to weigh in. So, uh, so you know, uh, one question uh, you know that I might pose to the group, um, you know. Um, Obviously, the center is just starting. You're just beginning uh, you know, your work. We just finished our first year. But um, uh, when do you think uh, these tools will be uh, you know, kind of ready for prime time? When are we going to be doing uh, you know, mesoscale functional mapping uh, you know, in, our, uh, in our patients? Are, are we ready for that today? Or uh, are there some other key steps that we need to build first? Anybody want to take that on? John, you're uh, maybe closest to uh, some of the users. Do you want to uh, make some comments about where we are and, and where we'll be over the next 12 months? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I think that, uh, you know, some technologies, you know, are, you know, closer than others, right? I mean, I was impressed, you know, Steve and Daniel made a lot of progress 
on the uh, Namer Samer technique. You know, getting that you know working in ice is a you know, no small feat. And so it seems like some of our technologies, you know, may be ready for use. You know, I think for a lot of the tools, you know, I think it, you know, we have a long history of working with groups, you know, who want to be early adopters of technologies. And sometimes this does require a little bit of extra effort, you know, to maybe take the raw data, for example, off the scanner and do some uh, reconstructions in MATLAB. I think that's definitely something that we can set up, you know, right now. Um, I don't know if, I, I guess I could also call on, uh, you know, Birkin and Fushua to kind of speak from the TRD2 perspective. I mean, I think that from the TRD3 perspective, yeah. So some of these tools obviously are sort of, you know, longer term investments. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Matthias's, you know, PNS uh, simulations are just outstanding. And, you know, we're starting to see that these are now kind of influencing some of these gradient coil designs. Hopefully we can get some of those gradient coils here at the Martina Center to utilize them and kind of take advantage of their performance. Um, certainly, yeah. Yeah, Felicia uh, or Birkin, do you guys want to weigh in? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. That was a really great question. And uh, I think for EPTI, we already showed that it can uh, potentially help with the specificity um, on fMRI. And uh, I think moving forward, and we want to uh, further increase the, you know, the resolution in order to create to it be able to be like really useful and there's like to make it robust, like motion robust. And uh, and we've already developed a lot of uh, correction method for V0. And those are uh, very important uh, to really um, like for it to be robust to use for a lot of patients and to look at their, their, their uh, responses um, for that. And I think, um, yeah. Um, I think we're still like uh, moving towards that goal, but I think in uh, like um, it's it's gonna um, 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 like uh, achieve that in like a few, um, I mean one or two years, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. No, Avery has a question on whether we have plans for pursuing non-bold uh, contrasts. Yeah, it's very. You can yeah. ask your question if you want. Avery, you want to uh, jump in and pose your question mm -hmm. or uh, we can pose it for you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, I had my laptop shut. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, uh, I, I'm obviously working on the functional MR side of things, but I was curious on the on the functional MR side of things. Um, there's been uh, there was quite a bit of discussion today on on kind of more traditional. Well, I wouldn't say traditional, but on, on bold or you know blood oxygenation level dependent um, contrast mechanisms. Uh, both Fuyusha's kind of more pure T2 Spinecco weighted EPTI acquisition as well as uh, what Larry and John showed with the deblurring of the M. Um, but there's obviously a lot of non-bold uh, acquisitions that are becoming or coming into vogue um, over the last hmm, almost five to 10 years. And so I was curious if there were plans in this uh, center-wide grant to, to look at some non-bold contrast mechanisms as well for, for kind of high resolution mesoscale mapping. Yeah, so maybe I can I can start to answer that, and you know, of course, you know, for sure, if you want to jump in. But uh, what I'd say is, you know, in short, yes, you know, I would like to. I think that um, you know, we would obviously like to look at some of these, you know, uh, methods. I think that one of the goals, uh, especially with um, you know TRD three with the deblurring, uh, one of the goals there is to use kind of more traditional bold acquisitions, you know, gradient equibold, which has the highest uh, sensitivity of any method. Um, and see if we can get it to achieve both high sensitivity and specificity, you know, by removing, you know, these vascular compounds, right? So the idea would be, you know, to have our cake and eat it too. I mean, I think a lot of these non-bolt techniques, you know, do provide, you know, more microvascular specificity, but at a cost. And so one thing that we're hoping for is to kind of focus in on, you know, the gradient echo bolt, where we sort of understand the signaling mechanisms very well and see if we can make that, you know, kind of more competitive. With some of these non-bold techniques, and I think that one way to do that would be to do a head-to-head -head comparison, 
right? So I think that non-bold has a role to play in terms of comparing, um, comparing you know, the deep blurred uh, grading nickel bolds uh, with uh, non-bold acquisitions. Uh, for EPTI, you know, we also have plans to uh, reproduce some experiments that have been recently performed with non-bold techniques you know, to see how EPTI kind of stacks up. Um, John, and, would, you, would you think it's fair to say that those out there listening who have an interest in, say, ASL-type methods mm -hmm. or ASO-type methods mm -hmm. would be very welcome as collaborators uh, for the P41 to bring those technologies in and, and try to build connections? to what we're uh, generating? Absolutely, gosh, you know, that'd be, that'd be most welcome. You know, absolutely, especially, yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, just to name, yeah, CBF uh, with ASL, CBV with uh, VASO. Um, no, it'd be fantastic. If anyone has interests in kind of pursuing these technologies, you know, certainly you know, let us know. And again, I think that we'd like to compare, we'd like to see how they stack up with, uh, you know, these, you know, more kind of uh, conventional techniques and, uh, and to kind of see, I mean, you know, my guess is that no one technique is going to be, <laughs> you know, the, you know, one method for every, uh, you know, every study. Um, different studies have different, you know, requirements, but no, it'd be great to do this comparison and see how the deep blurred, you know, gradient echo bold, for example, kind of compares. In terms of EPTI, I mean, gosh, we get, I'm, I'm eager to apply EPTI to, as a readout uh, for some of these non-bold techniques as well. So it's another place, another kind of intersection point, Avery, where, you know, I think some of the tools that we can, you know, that we're developing here will be useful for non-bold acquisitions as well. Great. Um, well, uh, I suspect there are lots of other uh, potential questions and uh, maybe people are, uh, you know, holding back, but uh, hopefully this has given you at least, uh, you know, some broad sense for uh, what we're uh, interested in, uh, what the uh, center is doing. Um, keep in mind, uh, you know, we really uh, are, are looking for hard projects to kind of uh, test out the technology and move things forward. Um, reach out to us um, across any of these domains. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about uh, all the great new technology on the Array TMS efforts, but uh, that's uh, super exciting. And, um, you know, we're really hoping to expand our neuromodulatory efforts. Uh, both at the Martino Center broadly, but uh, certainly within the uh, context of the uh, P41 based on Oppo's work and his colleagues um, and, and many other domains. So uh, reach out to us, uh, engage with us, follow us on Twitter. Is that what we're supposed to say? <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I've heard other people say that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll look forward to uh, having, uh, having more uh, interaction with all of you, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, weeks, months, uh, and years to come. Thanks uh, all for your attention. Yeah, thank you everyone. I want to thank all the speakers again, and thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, and thank you for attending Bream Up today. Definitely follow us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so bye everyone. Um, stay safe.